Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a people person. I um, I'm fully engaged in life. I'm an extrovert. Um, I am into food. I'm into reading. I'm into hiking. Um, I, I'm into music. I'm a singer. Um, I'm a former athlete, and uh, I'm a mama and a wife, and I'm all those things. And then all of that was blown up when I received my first cancer diagnosis, which was an incurable cancer diagnosis, followed two months later by a second unrelated cancer diagnosis. So um, I actually had just been promoted into a new role. I went from managing a very large team to actually being, being an individual contributor and, and found that I had some extra time. So I thought I would go do all of those doctor's appointments that I had been putting off, you know, which is always an ominous beginning to a story. So I, um, I went to the dentist and had a deep cleaning of my teeth. And that's when a week later, I noticed a lump in the floor of my mouth. But Stephanie, honestly, I had never noticed it before. And I initially just thought it was probably an infection. And uh, that, that was the first symptom of that cancer was a lump. There, so there was a lump on the mouth, uh, the floor of your mouth. So, yeah. Um, and it just, you just suddenly felt it. You hadn't felt it before. Were there other symptoms that accompanied that? And, and what prompted you to go, go actually get, you know, get checked out or go to the doctor? Yeah. So um, it was just, you know, the normal cleaning that I hadn't done in about a year. And it was just, I, I guess the, the tumor finally reached a size where I would notice it. And I, it was a very, very slow growing tumor. And the doctor said it had probably been there for a while, had been growing for a while, but I just hadn't noticed. And there was no, there was no pain. I wasn't having dry mouth. There was no other indication other than a lump that didn't hurt at all. It was just a weird lump. Um, so the dentist said, let's, um, you know, it could be somewhere on the spectrum of anywhere from just an infection. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's this really, really rare form of cancer, which Sarah, I'm sure it isn't. Um, but she said, you know, you should just go see a specialist. So she referred me to a specialist who referred me to another specialist, you know, and you know how that, that goes. So I actually had a number of scans and I think it was the second or third specialist who said, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, really knowledgeable in this kind of oncology, but I think I might see a malignant growth in your mouth. I think that's what it might be. And so I'm going to refer you to another specialist. And um, so, I mean, at, at that point, you know, I had an indication that there might be a malignancy, but I honestly, Stephanie, I didn't believe it. I said, well, this guy, he doesn't really know that much about these things. And I'm sure it couldn't be a malignancy. I mean, it couldn't be cancer. Uh, but I did go, you know, pursue it with another specialist who eventually had me do a fine needle aspiration and FNA. And that was when they said, yeah, it sure is cancer. Um, so were you worried about the results or were you still, before you heard, you were fine? I was, I was not worried, especially because when I would see specialists and they would, you know, palpate the tumor, they'd say, oh, well, it's not cancer. I'm not sure what it is, but it's not cancer. So actually the doctor, the specialist that, that called me to diagnose me, I had seen him a week prior. He was the one who had ordered the FNA. And when he had seen me in person, he had said, you know, this is definitely not cancer. You're, he, he actually made me out to be a hypochondriac. He was like, you're just making a really big deal out of this. And, that, and I thought, oh, okay, great. I'm glad that I'm making a big deal out of it and that it's not going to be cancer. Um, but then he called me on the phone and said, Sarah, I know I told you that it wasn't cancer, but I was wrong. It's cancer. And it's this really, really rare form of cancer that's incurable. And so then I started asking him questions and he's like, I don't know anything. I mean, I'm on the internet looking it up. <laughs> and uh, so he was going to refer me to another specialist. And I said, you know, okay, um, can you and I call that specialist right now? And he said, no, um, I'll write a letter of recommendation for you. He, he didn't use those words, sir. But, but, you know, communication is like, um, 
what is it? The research says that communication, 7% of it is the words we use. 93% of it is our body language and our tone. And so it's very clear to me in speaking with him that he thought that I was just making too big a deal out of it. And then it turned out to be cancer. And Stephanie, what I will tell you is my experiences, even though I didn't think it was cancer, I didn't believe it was cancer, I wanted to understand what it was. And I thought we should get it removed. So I kept pursuing everyone. Each time I would approach a specialist, they'd say, well, I can see you in six weeks to three months, you know, so I kept having to push it uh, in order to get an answer. And when I finally did, the answer was cancer. When I when I do corporate talks, or when I go sp speak to patients, I often say, you know, you're you your health is most important to you there's no one who's going to care more about your health than you so you need to be an advocate for yourself and you need to speak up even when other people are are not trusting or are questioning you and it actually sadly or happily segues ni nicely into my second cancer diagnosis which um I uh I had had the surgery to remove uh the tumor in my mouth and I was speaking with my head and neck oncology uh, surgeon, and he and I were talking about the treatment options. I was going to have uh, radiation next to treat the salivary gland cancer. And as I was speaking to him, I said, you know, I have a whole list of questions, including, you know, six years ago, I found a lump in my breast. And I showed my OBGYN. She sent me to a mammogram. We ended up biopsying it. I was told it wasn't cancer, but I'm wondering, given that I have this cancer diagnosis, could it be that it, it is metastatic salivary gland cancer in my breast and they just missed that it was a different kind of cancer? Is that possible? Um, you know, what should I do? And he, he said to me, Sarah, you already have one of the most rare forms of cancer there is. And when it metastasizes, it likes to go to your brain or your lungs. So he said, so if you have a lump in your breast, um, it, it wouldn't be salivary gland cancer. It would be another primary source cancer, breast cancer. And he's like, and frankly, we just don't see it in someone so young. But if it'll make you feel better, you should pursue it. So Stephanie, that's what I did. So I walked out once again, feeling like, wow, I'm making too much of this. But I thought, you know, let me let me just check back in and let me put my concerns to rest. And I went back to my OBGYN and she said, you know, Sarah, um, I know you've been doing mammograms every year, but you have really dense breasts and sometimes tumors don't show up in mammograms. And, you know, maybe we should do an MRI. And Stephanie, I thought, why am I just hearing about this now? And then uh, secondarily, I showed her where we had biopsied the lump in my breast. And she was like, Sarah, have you ever noticed that the surgical remark, that the surgical mark and your tumor or lump, <laughs> she said, um, they're nowhere near one another. I don't think they biopsied the lump. And so it was at that point <laughs> that I was like, oh my God, I have breast cancer. And, and so, you know, we did another biopsy and I, at that point had stage three breast cancer. So again, I had to advocate for myself to get the second diagnosis. And in a weird kind of world, the salivary gland diagnosis actually saved my life because it caused me to go back and question the lump in my breast. But that first diagnosis you got, because what I heard was that you were, you, you leapt right into being inquisitive and wanting to figure out. And, but so how would you describe your reaction to the first can cancer diagnosis? And then again, for your second yeah, um, the first cancer diagnosis, I think initially I was numb. I, I, I um, you know, I was having trouble processing it. And um, I don't think I cried. Like I was diagnosed on a Wednesday. I don't think I cried until late Thursday afternoon. Um, I just was stunned and wasn't sure how to react. And kind of went into project management mode immediately, just like, let me try to control the situation. And um, then once I recognized it, I was terrified. Um, I felt like I was in fight or flight all the time, like just absolutely in a panic. Like that's all I could think about. Oh my God, I have cancer. Oh my God, I have cancer. 
So, um, so I was terrified. I was um, strangely ashamed. Still trying to figure that one out. I'm not the only one who has said that. Like, I didn't do anything to cause this cancer, but there's some sort of uh, embarrassment um, uh, for like having a body weakness or something, or maybe it was the embarrassment of talking to people about my mortality or, you know, various bodily functions at, or whatever. But, but yeah, I, I was terrified and I wanted to be super, super private. What I wanted to do was just get it done, get all of the treatment treatments done. And I just wanted to get back into my life and put it behind me and ignore it. And so a lot of different feelings and adjectives. With the second cancer diagnosis, um, there was a certain amount of gallows humor that my husband and I kind of developed. It seemed ridiculous that there were now two cancers. It seemed improbable. Um, it seemed like cancer was coming to get me. And in a way, um, I relaxed. And I think in part, um, it accelerated my acceptance of having cancer. Um, I was very aware or doing a lot of thinking about, gosh, it's very likely that this is this that this is the last year of my life. it's it's highly likely. And if so, um, what do I want that to look like? How can I live as gracefully as I can? And I decided to become a lot more public. So after the second cancer diagnosis, I was pretty much telling anybody who would listen to me that I had two cancers and I started a blog on the Caring Bridge uh, to really alert people or you know keep people up to speed on what was going on. And that really became an outlet for me. Um, what a difference it, 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 it made. Um... In describing that, okay, if this is the last year of my life, what do I want it to look like? Outside of being more vocal about your cancers, what what else was that? What else filled that for you? Yeah, what became very clear to me, um, my biggest insight is there is nothing more important than our relationships, which maybe is like, like duh, everybody knows that. But truly, when I thought I was dying, the only thing that was important was being with my husband, being with my closest friends and family. It, nothing else mattered. Like every everything, you know, my to-do list, which had always been, you know, as tall as I was, my to-do list was, you know, reduced to to live. <laughs> and um, in doing so, uh, I just wanted to be with the people I loved most. And I had always, you know, I'd been living in San Francisco for 10 years at that point, but I had been commuting down to Silicon Valley every single day. So arguably there were parts of San Francisco I hadn't explored. So I, I just decided to spend the year kind of exploring the museums, the restaurants, the little neighborhoods. And I did it with friends and I did it with my husband. And um, I just, kind of leaned into all of that. And so from that point of view, um, were there any reflections about the time? I know you were like, all that matters is relationships. Was there any reflection about all the time that you had spent up until that point? It, did I regret it? <laughs> did I regret the time? You know, I, did, I, I didn't regret the time. I, you know, I, I haven't spent a lot of time in my life focused on regret. Um, I just kind of accepted I had done a lot of things prior and that maybe I was coming to the end of being able to do things. What was super interesting to me is um, the cancer diagnosis was very freeing at work when I eventually went back to work. So after a year of cancer treatments, I returned to work into the chief of staff role to the president of eBay, which was the role I had, I had taken on just, just prior to the cancer diagnosis. And um, I didn't care as much about getting ahead. I, ju I just didn't. I, wanted, I still wanted to do an excellent job. I wanted to be valued. I wanted to be listened to. I wanted a seat at the table. Um, but uh, having kind of stared at my own mortality, I, I just recognized it really wasn't that important for me to um, continue to push at work. And 
Um, whereas before I, I the, it wasn't that I wasn't still hard driving. It's just, I think it softened my edges and I was now leaning into how people felt about things rather than how efficient or effectively can we get things done. I love that. Thank you for that. And yeah, it doesn't have to be regret, but there's certainly a new perspective and, and some shifts that happen there. But in terms of the specifics, so with the, the salivary gland, um, cancer, what was the treatment for that? And, and yeah. what was that experience like? Yeah. So for salivary gland cancer and something that, that I'd love to speak to just super quickly is the difference in getting a diagnosis for a rare cancer versus getting the diagnosis for an un, <laughs> a not rare cancer. Um, so when I was diagnosed with the uh, salivary gland cancer, I was told um, super rare, uh, I, it's incurable, only 1200 people a year are diagnosed with it. Um, we don't have good data as a result. We don't, you know, uh, we know that five years out, 80% uh, of people are still alive. 10 years out, only 30% of people are still alive. Um, and they only basically had two treatments. It was cut it out, surgery, and then radiate the crap out of it. And so I, I, I leaned in on both. I said, great, you know, let's get rid of it and then let's radiate. And my doctor said, um, you know, gosh, Sarah, uh, it might leave you with dry mouth. And I said, oh, I, I can deal with six weeks of dry mouth. And he said, for the rest of your life. And I thought, oh God, oh God. And there are people who have been treated for oral cancers who, you know, whose reality is now dry mouth for the rest of their lives. And I, I do experience dry mouth, but it's it's not extreme. Um, but for the uh, breast cancer, you know, they said, uh, when I received that diagnosis, they said, gosh, Sarah, um, you actually have a garden variety type of breast cancer. It's the most common kind of breast cancer there is. We have a number of treatments for it and we think we got you. We think we can cure you of it. So it's just a very different conversation. And what they said is, you know, gosh, what we'd like to do is, is the, our, you know, favored protocol for you would be, we will start out with about six months of chemo. Um, and we will use that to the breast oncologist said chemo um, erases the footprints of cancer in your body. And she said, I just want to make sure it hasn't gone anywhere else. And we're going to make sure by giving you chemo. And she said, it'll also break down the tumor and make it smaller for us to remove. So we'll have better breast preservation. So a lumpectomy was an option for me. And I decided to, to go with that option. Um, so we did chemo for uh, two kinds of chemo for six months. And then I had two different breast surgeries because we didn't get clean margins, sadly, after the first one. And then I went through six weeks of radiation. But what was super interesting <laughs> is that um, they treated me for both at the same time. So actually I was getting radiation to the mouth at the same time that I was getting chemotherapy to my body for the breast cancer. And what that does is uh, chemotherapy actually intensifies radiation so after two weeks of both radiation and chemo, the, um, uh, the technicians who were giving me the radiation in my mouth, I was like, oh, wow, I seem to have a little bit of bleeding. And they looked at my mouth and they said, uh, and I was like, is this normal? And they're like, well, it's normal for like six weeks in. They're like, this is, this is pretty early. So I ended up with... Um, like 20 cold sores in my mouth and my mouth felt like, um, felt like it was sunburned. I, I had a three to four week period where I couldn't eat. I would, um, you know, I would, I would do some chicken broth with truffle salt because it made it better, but um, I just, I couldn't eat for about four weeks. Yeah. It was like a full six months. Um, and then surgery, then surgery, then other radiation. So treatments went over a year. It was a, it was a full year. How would you describe that year of where Sarah was mentally and emotionally? Yeah. Um, I think that the cancer battle is as much mental and emotional as it is physical. At least it was for me. I, I have 
I believe, a pretty high threshold of pain that was certainly tested <laughs> by uh, by the chemo and radiation, certainly tested. But um, I, I was in so much uh, emotional and mental pain, anguish, just um, out of all of my fear uh, that I actually, after the second cancer diagnosis, I went to my breast oncologist and I said, I need help. Um, I'd really appreciate it if you could uh, prescribe an anti-anxiety medication for me, because at this point, I'm not sure that, um, you know, I'm in, I'm in, I'm so stressed out. I'm in such high fight or flight that I'm not convinced I won't have a heart attack before either one of these cancers is able to kill me. So I got um, an anti-anxiety medication that I would um, take every day. Um, I would take uh, the pill every day around three o'clock, which seemed to be the witching hour for me. That would be, I, I would hold it together till about three and then I would just start losing my shit. And um, so I would take it, but I, but I also, one of my best friends uh, at the time and still one of my best friends uh, was a yoga instructor. So um, this friend of mine, Tripti, uh, you know, I started taking her yoga class. Uh, I started doing meditation. I did guided imagery. I did energy work and she recommended to me an acupuncturist. So I started doing all of those things to try to uh, relax my body and relax my mind so that I could best accept the treatments. And um, I, I don't know, my my theory, my working theory is that when I relaxed, the uh, medication was really able to work and help save my life. And then I just, you know, it just became about putting one foot in front of the other. I knew what the plan was. I knew when I had to drive down to Stanford and go for my treatments. And I just did it until I was finished how bad did it get for you? You talked about, I know at three o'clock was sort of the witching hour, but yeah, yeah. what was it that was really going through your head and what were you really feeling that brought you down so much? If you could just describe remembering what that, those moments were like for you. Yeah. I, well, I was 44. I had just, I mean, I met my husband when we were 38 and I had, you know, I, I, felt like I was busy having a fabulous life. And I was so thrilled to now have met my life partner and, and was so thrilled. You know, we were pursuing fertility. We were working with a fertility doctor. I was just so excited about what was to be in my life. And I would just gotten promoted into this great role at eBay. Um, and I felt like, you know, I just felt like there was so much, much possibility. Everything was going so right. And I fell in love with this kind of dream of what my future was going to be. And I think part of what a cancer diagnosis is, is death of a dream. Um, and I don't think that that's too hard or too dramatic a comment to make. I think it's death of a dream of what you believe the future is going to be. And so I, you know, uh, similar to mourning the death of a loved one, in this case, I was mourning my potential death. Um, it was serious. And I, I went through all of the stages of grief. So I would say I, I was in grief, but, it, but I was in mourning. I was sad and I was scared. Not just, a, you know, some short <laughs> one and done type of a thing, but I appreciate the way you describe it. Yeah. Gr well, grief is nonlinear, right? And I think what is surprising is, is how it will catch us. It will catch us. So not surprising that like a year or two after you can find yourself talking to somebody about it and and you get a catch or um, tears come quickly to your eyes. And I, I have often described it to people like having a wound on the skin that you keep touching, you know, and it just comes back and it kind of shocks you and you're like, oh, my God, it's still so close to the surface. It's still so close. Um, I'm now at the point where I, I can talk about it and I can laugh about it. I'm also 10 years out. And so that's a different perspective as well, right? You know, with breast cancer, the important years are two years out, five years out, 10 years out. And generally they will, you know, uh, declare you cured of breast cancer. If in 10 years you haven't had a recurrence, um, uh, the salivary gland cancer, you know, doesn't have the same 
type of thing, but certainly um, the statistics I was talking before, I'm in the 30% of people um, who are surviving um, with, with that cancer. You've survived not once, not one of those statistics, but two. Just any immediate reflection on that? <laughs> um, I, I, I really think it comes down to being lucky. I mean, I also had terrific treatments and I don't mean to downplay um, the doctors were amazing at Stanford, utterly amazing. And they coordinated my care. So both teams of doctors were checking in regularly with one another. Um, they also checked in with me as a whole person. So I felt comfortable talking with my breast oncologist about getting anti-anxiety medication because every time I talked to her, she would walk into the room, she would grab my leg, she would look in my eyes and she'd say, how are you doing? How are you doing? I think that's so important. Sarah, is there anything that you want to get across that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, I mean, we hit on some of my biggest insights, which were, you know, you got to be your own best advocate. Um, you've got to um, uh, take care of yourself in this. You've got to ask for help. That the most important things, um, the, the most important things are the people in our lives, our relationships. And then, you know, um, the, the biggest thing, you know, that I want to shout from the mountaintops is this idea of we've got to stop talking about cancer in a whisper. Like, she has cancer. We need to talk about it in full voice. People are like, I, I don't want to talk about it because it's scary and I'll give power to cancer. But by keeping it in the shadows, that's where we give it power. You know, I, I, and I have found now that I'm less afraid to talk about cancer, I'm less afraid to talk about mortality. I'm able to talk about, talk with people who are in crisis in other ways, because all I'm doing is asking the question that is in the mind of the person going through the crisis. And I'm able to hold space for people that way. So I guess my encouragement is just like, stop whispering about cancer. Let's talk about it in full voice. Let's all practice so we can show up for one another.